Well, good morning. Good to see you all. You can join me in opening your Bibles to the book of Leviticus. It'll be our last Sunday in this uh, book here, part of this series. If you don't have a Bible with you, you can find one under the seats nearby. And Leviticus 27 is where we will be, and that's page 106. Um, we started this series by noting that Leviticus is often the, uh, the book where Bible reading plans go to die. And my hope through here was not the place where sermon series go to die. Uh, so I've, I've loved this. I know that um, if you got nothing else, if you were watching Jeopardy this week, you knew the final Jeopardy answer. A few of you let me know that this series was helpful for that. Um, but in light of the, the, the prayer uh, that we prayed earlier, um, this book is about uh, the one true God and how good He is, who we really are, and Him coming to dwell with us, to know Him and live in His grace. So we'll be wrapping up this series this morning. Uh, we'll have a short series after this on Jesus and how He speaks with authority to a number of issues today, and then we'll be in the book of James after that. Um, the idea of James is that it's just about as different as Leviticus as you could get. Uh, so we'll have some variation here. Uh, let's pray before we begin. Our Father, we thank You for Your Word. Thank You for the book of Leviticus. Thank You for uh, this being Your inspired Word, true in all that You say. And we pray that You would uh, work Your powerful work in our hearts and minds and lives this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we live in a world uh, filled with grumbling and griping, TV, news, workplace, homes, our own headspace, and social media amplifies it and spreads a tone of cynicism and criticism all over the place. So our world needs an alternative. And the opposite of grumbling, griping, criticism, complaining, and that tone is not superficial optimism, but grateful realism. So it's realism about our real hardships in life and the sin in the world and in our own hearts, but there's also the ability to see that God is the giver of everything good, and He's working everything together for good with infinite wisdom and goodness, and He's inviting us to live lives of grateful thanksgiving. So how can we make a shift which we'll need to keep making over and over in our lives, a shift from grumbling to giving thanks. Some of you need to maybe decisively make a shift in your life because you are primarily in a season or life of grumbling. Others of us wake up grumbly. I wake up grumbly. Uh, how do we make this shift from grumbling to giving thanks? Well, there's a particular path to follow, and we learn this path from the 1500s catechisms. So we love catechisms at our church. The middle school students are working through the New City Catechism together. We also appreciate the Heidelberg Catechism, and that's structured by a few, uh, with a few core ideas that we can summarize as guilt, grace, and gratitude. And we can add God to the beginning of that since that's the starting point. So this is the pathway. God, guilt, grace, leading to gratitude. So that's the path we need to follow to replace grumbling with gratitude. It's also a summary of the central message of the Bible, the gospel. If you're not a Christian, in learning what the Bible means by those words and those realities is the pathway to become a Christian. If you want to share about Jesus with others, just memorizing those four words can help give a framework for the topics that people need to understand and know to come to know Jesus. So we start with God, the triune God, who's the good, wise, and loving creator of all things. And then in comparison with Him, in response to Him, we recognize that we have guilt. We've rejected Him. We sin in many ways. Part of it is our own grumbly heart. And God responds with grace. Jesus came to take our judgment so that we could receive His blessing, receive forgiveness, and eternal life. And so all of this leads then to gratitude, growing in the life of giving thanks to God. This is also a fitting response to everything we've seen in Leviticus. So we're finishing this series in the book of Leviticus, and one way to summarize what we've seen in the book of Leviticus up until the last chapter is God, guilt, and grace. And now the last chapter focuses on gratitude. Leviticus 27 guides God's people 
with how to live a life of God-centered gratitude. Now, at first, if uh, you've read ahead, which I hope many of you do, uh, read ahead and read this chapter for the morning, it might have seemed like kind of a boring appendix of leftover rules. It's kind of not sure where to put them else in the book, so we'll just kind of tack them at the end. Chapter 26 seemed like a fine conclusion, Uh, but this is not an appendix. It's actually a response to the whole book. The assumption of this chapter is that God's people should respond to His grace with gifts of gratitude, and this chapter is giving guidance to God's people for how to do that. So this chapter guides God's people with how to show gratitude. So here's the message. God's grace leads God's people to respond with gratitude marked by faithfulness, faithfulness, sacrifice, and wisdom. So we're not going to read through the whole chapter here at the beginning. We'll read through it as we go. And this chapter is about gratitude, and it shows us two gifts and three principles. So really simple outline this morning. Two gifts, three principles. Okay, so first... Israel expressed gratitude with two kinds of gifts, promised gifts and immediate gifts. So the first are promised gifts. These are vows. A vow is a promise to give God something in response to answered prayer. It's usually done in a desperate situation. So you cry out to God, you beg Him to deliver, and then you add a vow to your desperate plea. So it may sound something like this. If you get me out of this situation, I promise I'll start going to church. Or if you rescue me, I promise that I'll be done with that sin. Or I'll do whatever you want. So the first 13 verses of this chapter focus on big promises. Promises to give God your life or the life of an animal in devotion. So the person would say something like, if you deliver me, I'll give myself to you. I'll devote myself to you. I'll give myself to serve you like a priest. Or, um, if you deliver me from this situation, I devote my whole family to your service. So, one example of this is Hannah in 1 Samuel. She was bullied and shamed for being childless, and she longed for a child, and she pleaded with God for a child. And she promised that if God gave her a child, she would devote that child to God's service. And God answered her prayer. And, he, and so she fulfilled her vow. She, she let her child, Samuel, grow up and serve in the tabernacle. Now, here's a practical challenge with this. What if a lot of people, I mean, hundreds of people start vowing, I will devote myself to your service like a priest for the rest of my life, or hundreds of people pray like Hannah and say, I'm going to give you my son and let him serve in the tabernacle. I mean, the, the priesthood isn't set up to run a daycare for hundreds of Israelite children. So how do they fulfill these vows? Well, that's actually what this text focuses on. A person could give a financial equivalent to, for the labor. So let's read verses 1 through 8. And as we read this, don't be offended by the, diff, the different uh, financial values associated with different people or ages. Um, these are not given to express the intrinsic wor- worth of a person. Every person has infinite value, man or woman, young or old. These are equivalent values for their labor in an agricultural society. So, you can read it with me here. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the people of Israel and say to them, if anyone makes a special vow to the Lord involving the valuation of persons, Then the valuation of a male from 20 years old up to 60 years old shall be 50 shekels of silver according to the shekel of the sanctuary. If the person is a female, the valuation shall be 30 shekels. If the person is from 5 years old up to 20 years old, the value shall be for a male 20 shekels and for a female 10 shekels. If the person is from a month old up to 5 years old, the valuation shall be for a male 5 shekels of silver and for a female the valuation shall be 3 shekels of silver." And if the person is 60 years old or over, then the valuation for a male shall be 15 shekels and for a female 10 shekels. And if someone is too poor to pay the valuation, then he shall be made to stand before the priest and the priest shall value him. The priest shall value him according to what the vower can afford. So every person is valuable. Psalm 49 says that a person cannot ultimately even be valued. 
They are priceless. But in this context, they do have a kind of production value to society that required physical labor. So these are valued according to earning potential. So you can see men and women in their prime have more earning potential than any other age. So why give these values at all, though? Well, because in this context, a person is vowing to give themselves or a family member to be a servant of the Lord, or they're, they're vowing to give the valuation of a person to the Lord. And this is a way of having them understand then what is the practical equivalent. How can they know how much if they want to offer to give themselves or offer to give a financial equivalent for the life of someone? Now, these were large amounts. So some of these would be the wages of many years of service. So not everyone could afford this. And this is why verse 8 gives an accommodation for the poor. We've seen through Leviticus just how often God has the poor in mind with his rules to care for them. So how can a poor person make this kind of massive vow if they can't repay it? Well, here the priest can basically say, God will honor what you can afford. Because the point isn't the money. God doesn't need it. The point is the heart attitude. The point is sacrificing as an expression of gratitude. Then verses 9 through 13 give guidance for vows related to animals. So if you promise to offer God an animal... This verse gives guidance, so we can read it together, beginning in verse 9. If the vow is an animal that may be offered as an offering to the Lord, all of it that he gives to the Lord is holy. He shall not exchange it or make a substitute for it, good for bad or bad for good. And if he does, in fact, substitute one animal for another, then both it and the substitute shall be holy. And if it is any unclean animal that may not be offered as an offering to the Lord, then he shall stand the animal before the priest, and the priest shall value it as either good or bad. As the priest values it, so it shall be. But if he wishes to redeem it or buy it back, he shall add a fifth to the valuation. So two key details to note here. First, if you promised one animal, God, I will give you this animal if you, um, and just offer this to him, then you can't exchange or substitute it for another. Why not? Why give a law about that? Why does it matter if someone promised one animal and gives another? Well, because people tend to make big promises and then give less. So they may promise, God, if you give me out, get me out of this situation, I will give you my best bull, which would have been a a massive amount uh, for them at that time. And then when God delivers him, he thinks, well, I really need that bull, uh, but I do have this injured one over here or this little injured goat, I'll give that. That's fine, right? That's still a sacrifice. Same thing. And the second detail is about redeeming the animal. So redeeming means buying it back. So you promise to give it to God, but you change your mind. So the rule is, okay, but you have to pay its worth and add 20%. Now, why would that rule be here? Well, probably in part to defer, deter people from making rash vows. It makes them think before they do it. If you're going to offer to give something to God, you better mean it and follow through. I sold digital cameras at Best Buy for several years, and we had a restocking fee to deter people from just buying and returning. You had to add a certain percentage uh, if you were going to return it. So both of these rules help people honor their commitments because these are here because people tend to make big promises when they're in desperate circumstances. But then when God answers the prayer, what do they do? What do we do? We don't give as much or we forget about him. We ask big and thank little. People say, if you heal me, I'll get serious serious about you. I'll start reading my Bible more. I'll go to church every Sunday. And then when they get healed, life's back to normal as if it never happened. We make promises in the heat of the moment, but then when God actually responds and answers our prayers, we forget about him or we forget we even asked him or we think, well, this probably would have happened even if I didn't call out to him. Uh, same outcome either way. So we decide we don't want to fulfill a promise that we made. And this section says you need to fulfill it. But here are some practical solutions to fulfill these differently. But don't take advantage of it. To promise big and fulfill small is not expressing gratitude it's taking for granted. So that's the first kind of gift. Promised gifts, vows. The second are immediate gifts. So you dedicate something or set something apart for God, and it's a way of expressing gratitude, not for deliverance out of some crisis, but just in response to God's general kindness to you, or maybe particular kindness to you. So everything we have is a gift from God, so anytime we give anything to Him, 
He does not need it. We're just giving him what he already has. We're setting apart for his use what he already has given to us. He doesn't need anything, but sometimes it's fitting to offer something back to God in this context. And so they want to give God a big gift of gratitude. So beginning at verse 14, God gives guidance for how to do that wisely. So first, someone may want to dedicate a house or a plot of land to the Lord. So this is verses 14 to 15. You can read it with me. It says, when a man dedicates his house as a holy gift to the Lord, the priest shall value it as either good or bad. As the priest values it, so it shall stand. And if the donor wishes to redeem his house, he shall add a fifth to the valuation price, and it shall be his. So this person wants to give a house to God. This means it would be set apart perhaps for the priests to use as they saw fit. And the priest can decide on the value of the house. So if you want to then buy the house back, you can. But again, you have to pay a bit more for like a restocking fee, like 20% here. God gives exceptions to all of this in the rest of the chapter. So you can't devote firstborn animals, for instance, to God because those are already viewed as devoted to Him. You can't devote something to God that's already been dedicated to God. And if you dedicate something to God, you can't sell it to someone else else. And why not? I mean, these are all actually reasonable when you think it through, because that would be pretty cheap. It'd be a way of, you know, ripping God off while still looking spiritual. So you dedicate it to God as this spiritual act of giving to God, and then you sell it so you can get the money. So in the last verses, God gives guidance about giving tithes. So we think of a tithe as 10%, because that's what the word itself means. But when you actually add up all of Israel's tithes, they were giving something more like 23%. And they gave mainly to financially support the priests and to care for the poor. So those are the two gifts of gratitude. Promised gifts, vows, and immediate gifts. How do we apply this to our lives? What do we do with this? Well, we see three principles here. First, giving is responsive. It's a voluntary response to God's grace. None of these were required So these were ways for Israel to express thanks to God. So with promised gifts or vows, they're just making the promise of their own desire to respond to a future deliverance. So they're voluntarily offering God something if He delivers them. And then with immediate gifts or dedications, they're just already giving in response to some kindness they've received from God. So the principle still applies today, even if the way in which we're going to express this changes. Vows are rare, but they're still sometimes made in the New Testament. And we don't have priests to give houses or land to, but we still are encouraged to give for the same reasons that the Israelites were encouraged to give, to support Christian leaders and the mission and ministry of the church and to care for the poor. And so giving is viewed as a total, whole life, even whole body response. In the New Testament, it's especially a response to God's grace to us through Jesus. So the pattern of God seeing who He is and knowing Him and guilt, recognizing our sin and misery apart from Him, and then His grace to us, especially through Jesus and His redeeming salvation for us, all that leads to gratitude. That's the pattern of the book of Leviticus. That's the pattern of the whole Bible. That's the pattern of the Christian life. We see God's grace, and it leads us to gratitude. Romans 12 is the New Testament parallel to Leviticus 27. So the first 11 chapters of Romans unfold the topics of God and guilt and grace through Jesus, and then it leads to this response of gratitude. So here's how Romans 12 begins. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. So in light of all of His mercy, grace, in light of your guilt and who He is, I appeal to you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So this is dedication language. It's saying I'm offering my whole self to God as an act of sacrifice and worship. I'm dedicating myself and setting myself apart, my whole body, everything I have, as holy for God. There's a lot of connections there with what's going on in Leviticus here. So as a Christian, we are called and invited to respond to God's grace with giving everything we have. 
our whole life, our very bodies as gifts to God. We're to let this shape our whole culture and tone of our relationships and our church family. What should the tone of a church feel like if it's filled with people like this? What should a guest experience when he or she visits a church that has this kind of tone set? They should experience this sense of gratitude and joy among God's people. This kind of grateful and thanksgiving tone should shape our homes. So parents, you have a calling to cultivate this in your homes. You, you set the tone to help your kids see what it means to be a Christian. And what does it mean to be a Christian? What does it look like? Well, you're following this pathway of God, guilt, grace, and gratitude, which means a central mark of a Christian home is gratitude. It should be gratitude. You show your children what it looks like to live a life responding to grace with joy and thankfulness. Kids can tell if your faith is real. They can tell if it actually influences your decision. So there's a lot of studies that have come out in recent decades of, about why do kids raised in homes where parents are believers, why do they either stay faithful to Jesus, they actually, the faith becomes their own, or they leave and drift away. And of course, a key factor, the key factor is God Himself, right? He gives new hearts, which is why we pray and ask Him to do that, but He's the one who does it. But He often uses means to do this as well and to help these kids grow, and a central means is often the sincerity of the parents and the kind of home life that they have cultivated. So kids can tell if coming to church is just a habit because it's just what we do. They can tell if your prayers before meals are just perfunctory and you're saying the words because you memorized it and it's what we do. They can tell if you actually want to see them know Jesus. They can tell if you actually are responding to His grace with gratitude in everyday life. They can tell by watching whether or not you make costly, personally costly decisions to follow Jesus in your workplace or in our culture or in a relationship. So we have a great privilege, if you're a parent in this room, to introduce children or grandchildren to this pathway of God, guilt, grace, and gratitude. So that's the first principle. Gratitude is responsive. Maybe you're not a Christian yet. You're not sure what you think about even the idea of God or guilt or grace. So I'd ask you to consider your own experience of gratitude. Has there been a time or multiple times where you have been in awe, and you've seen the stars, or you visited the Grand Canyon, or you've held a newborn, and you, you were, your heart was filled with what you might refer to as gratitude. But what's interesting about those moments that we all experience is that gratitude is, is to be expressed to someone. We, we recognize that there's, there's a personal being that's, that's blessing us right now, and we do not deserve this. And so, gratitude isn't supposed to just be a vague feeling. It's to be directed to someone. So, I just encourage you to consider these moments and consider what they mean in your life. There's a personal God who's blessed you, and and those, those feelings of joy and awe and gratefulness are meant to be given and expressed to the one who made you. They're pointers that you were made for God. The second principle is faithfulness. So, gratitude is to be expressed faithfully. So, a key theme through this whole chapter is if you promised it, fulfill it. Don't change your mind. Don't promise big and then give small. So, God is addressing this tendency to cry out, make a big promise to Him, and then when He delivers you, you give small or you are half-hearted or you forget about it altogether. And the reason, uh, and a reason for this then is because our own hearts are ungrateful, but this should lead us to then be really careful about not promising more than we're intending to give. So, Deuteronomy 23 even cautions us about making vows. It says this, if you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay in fulfilling it, for the Lord your God will surely require it of you, and you'll be guilty of sin. But if you refrain from vowing, you will not be guilty of sin. You shall be careful to do what has passed your lips. 
For you have voluntarily vowed to the Lord your God what you have promised with your mouth. So do you have, and maybe you've been thinking about it already, do you have any unfulfilled vows to the Lord? Have you promised something to Him and not fulfilled it? If so, you should address that with Him. You should either fulfill it now Or if it was a rash vow, and there's a biblical category for that, you should apologize for that if you can't keep it. The Bible has a category for rash vows that shouldn't have been made and can't be kept. And unfulfilled vows are not the unforgivable sin either, though. It says you're guilty of sin, but it's not the unforgivable sin. There's grace for you, so bring that to God and receive fresh grace. Maybe you promised that if He gave you a certain job, you would give more financially to the church or to people in need. Maybe you promised that if He healed you, you'd read the Bible every day the rest of your life and pray more. Those are okay promises. So it's time to fulfill them then. And the truth is, we're often so weak that we can't fulfill these on our own. We need God's supernatural help to even make good on the very reasonable promises that we offer to Him. And that's okay. It's okay to ask Him for help to fulfill the very thing you promised to do for Him. One of my favorite verses is Paul's prayer in 2 Thessalonians 1.11, and he prays that our God may fulfill every resolve for good. So he's praying to this church. He knows that there are resolves for good in this community. And one of the things he prays for, for those Christians, is that God would fulfill our resolves for good. So you have resolves for good, whether vows or promises or just resolves. And how, I mean, how often do we have ambitions to do great things for Jesus and they just fizzle out? We're weak. And so one of the things we can do is not just make big resolves, but pray and ask God, would you fulfill this resolve for good in me? I can't pull this off on my own. And God's happy to do that. It's a prayer he loves to answer. A final principle of gratitude is that it's sacrificial. These gifts in this chapter were all very costly. People are giving God a house or land. They're promising to give their lives to Him. And then the equivalent cost of several years of wages, in addition to the tithes they were already giving, which was added up to 23 or so percent. So all these gifts in this chapter are voluntary, they're responding to God's grace, and they're also very costly. So if Israel is giving this much and expected to give this much, how much should New Testament Christians give? We've seen so much more of God and His grace, and there's so much more than to give. Well, this now wraps up the series on Leviticus, and we end then really where we began. The first week we saw that this was about restoring the life we lost in Eden, and what was Eden supposed to be like? Well, what kind of life were you and I created for if the world never had sin enter it and your own heart and mind weren't corrupted? What kind of world would this be? Well, it would be a world of gratitude. We would receive everything from God and we would give our whole selves as a sacrifice to Him. But we've now left Eden. We live in a world of sin and death and we've contributed to it. So what does God do? Well, we've seen in Leviticus that He draws draws near. He gave Israel this whole symbol-laden setup in Leviticus and everything about it, the tabernacle, the priests, the sacrifices, the food laws, all of it echoed Eden. And it also pointed forward to how God would restore and make better everything we lost in the beginning. It all points forward to Jesus in the new world to come. And so we now live in the age of fulfillment. Jesus has come, and He's come as the true tabernacle. He's come as the great high priest, offering Himself as the final sacrifice. He's brought the new covenant that brings transformation of the human heart with it and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit to change us. We can now receive total forgiveness, His indwelling presence as His people who are now the true tabernacle and presence of God, in a transformed life. And so a a central mark of this new age that Jesus has brought is gratitude, grateful thanksgiving, expressions of gratefulness. And a mark of a healthy church 
is gratitude. So I'll end by quoting uh, my favorite commentary through this series. It was a little book called Teaching Leviticus by G. Jeffrey Harper. And he, he says that Leviticus concludes here with a compelling picture of a thankful community coming to the one who continues to rescue and deliver, drawn ever deeper in worship and appreciation of their God. For a book so saturated with notes of divine grace, this is a most fitting end. And it's a most fitting way to live. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for not just the book of Leviticus, but all the realities in Jesus that it shows us. And so we pray that you would continue to help us to see with the eyes of our heart who you really are and your, all your holiness and your holy love and your power, and your wisdom, and your justice, and your goodness. We pray that we would rightly see ourselves in light of you and your word, and own our guilt when it's exposed by the Spirit, and confess that to you. We thank you for your grace, your grace upon grace through Jesus, like a flood water over, overtaking us, and washing us clean, and giving us forgiveness. And giving us joy. And so we pray that you would continue to make us a community that cultivates gratitude, that we would think how we can, even this week, take concrete steps to express thanksgiving to you and cultivate that in our home and in our church family. In Jesus' name, amen.